Okay. Welcome. So today we're going to start talking about Anthropic's transformer circuits work. And so uh, we'll start off with a very quick recap, assuming that most people are familiar with um, the transformer. But let me just share my screen real quick. There you go. All right. Mm -hmm. So so this is our famous uh, uh, transformer architecture, exactly how it looks in the uh, uh, in the attention is all you need paper, you'll see this all sorts of places. And then, uh, well, hoping you can see my mouse, I can change it. But if you look very closely, you'll see, well, you'll see not too hard that there's orange boxes and these represent attention mechanisms. And then blue boxes on this diagram represent regular old feed forward neural networks, you know, vector in, you've got X many nodes and, you know, vector out. So a lot of the, the, the focus has been on the attention part because, you know, we think we understand the neural network part a little better. Uh, but what is this thing doing? Okay. And um, so just a reminder that if you look closely, what you'll see is there's also this arrow before you get to the attention that goes to the left and then comes around the top um, that goes back into the the normalization and, and it adds that to whatever's coming out of the, the, the multi-head attention. So this is the residual connection. And so what we've talked about a couple times in the past is you could draw this slightly differently, okay? So uh, first of all, in a decoder only one, um, then you're, you're not gonna have uh, the encoder part on the left, you're only gonna have the part on the right. So big red X is showing the parts that you don't need. Uh, but then the next thing is, you can make this this residual connection um, a little bit clearer if you just draw the diagram a little differently. Okay, so we're going to take that out, scrunch it up, and then what we're going to do is you can see now a little better. This residual connection goes around attention, and another residual connection goes around the feed forward. But if instead of drawing it that way, we keep the residual connection straight and we draw the attention and the feed forward to the side. I think it becomes a lot clearer that this is a residual architecture, okay? If you had all zeros on your weights for your feed forward and your tension, then the data can just go straight on through, unmodified, okay? Um, so this makes that much clearer. So it's important to understand that this is a residual architecture where basically you have your original input in this next, not like original original, but like coming out of the, the, the pink bedding box. And then um, whatever comes out of here just gets added to it. Okay. Um, so that's the important thing to know. And then again, I think everybody's familiar, but if you're not too familiar with the transformer, we're usually talking about running this on multiple inputs. So for example, if it's a sentence, you have uh, one input per word, technically per token. Um, so what you want to do is you want to think of this as um, many of them lined up, you know, one for, for each word in the position. And most of the time you see people are going to do big, complex, deep models. So that means that you've got to stack multiple of these vertically. Okay. And so then that starts to look like this, where the dashed boxes are, are trans, uh, transformer layers. And you can have one, two, three, dot, 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 as many layers as you want. All right. And so your raw input, if it's if it's a language model, is just a vocabulary word number. So if you're if your vocabulary size fifty thousand, it's a number zero, an integer zero through forty nine 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 nine. It's not a vector. It's just a single integer saying it's word number three hundred seventy six or whatever. So. This, this pink box at the bottom, the output encoding, the, the, it says output encoding here that, that, sorry, that's a leftover from when you have both encoder and decoder. But this encoding box here turns that integer into a vector. And then at the very end, you see this softmax, um, you, you have basically 50,000 probabilities uh, for what the next word is. And we typically just look at the maximum probability and we say that's what we're gonna predict the next word to be. All right, so just quick overview, that's, that's, that's our attention architecture. Any, any questions? All right, 
Let me stop this. Let me switch over to my YouTube window. All right, I'm going to share this um, with audio. Uh, let me know if you have any problems, but I'm just going to say up front, this first video is pretty short. It's only three minutes long. And unfortunately, the audio on this is not very good. Somehow the speaker was not near the mic. It sounds like the speaker's not near the microphone. So for this one, just so you know, it is going to be quiet. I'll crank up the volume a little bit. But the second and the third video is probably what we're going to cover today. And those, the, the audio is much better. And Ted, just to uh, clarify, the agenda has the links to the videos, to all these videos, is that correct? Yes, and actually, um, I can also uh, the Dad, I can post Johnson. it. Okay, yeah, yeah, if you could, that'd be great. For just 67. So, I, mean, uh, I wanted I to get the playlist. I just not can't find the right words. words. Luckily, you have words, in, so don't sweat it. There are ads in this video, just so you guys know. Well, we're going to be dying. All right, so let me share this, and I'm going to crank up my volume a little bit because, like I said, this first video is not so great, but it'll get better on, on the other videos. ...to try and figure out how transformers mechanistically work. But uh, I'm sure you'll be shocked to learn that uh, transformers are pretty complicated to think about. And so rather than going and starting uh, with uh, full-on large transformers, and especially uh, the kind of really large uh, language models that we see in modern NL NLP. Um, we're going to start with a couple of videos uh, studying smaller, simplified versions of the transformer and work our way up. And in particular, uh, we're going to be starting right now with a zero-layer transformer, which is really the, the, the simplest model that you can sort of conceive of that um, bears any resemblance at all to a transformer. And, um, despite being so simple, there will be some small takeaways that are useful. And so we're going to briefly briefly talk about the zero layer transformer. So a zero layer transformer really just has two steps. Um, we're going to do a token embedding, and then we're going to do an unembedding to get the logins. So for the token embedding, um, we're going to go and think of the token as a one hot vector. And then we're going to multiply by WE, the word embedding. And that will give us the, the token embedding. And then we'll multiply by the unembedding matrix, and that does the logits. So two steps, that's the entire thing, that's the entire model. Um, and so we're just going in from the previous token, predicting the next token, uh, by going and multiplying those through those two matrices. And we can just write those out, um, if we want, as a product. And so that, that WEW unit matrix has to be representing um, the bigram statistics, the, the frequency is just that empirically one token follows another. And those bigram statistics in particular needs to go and represent the, the bigram log likelihoods, right? Because we're, we're going to go and feed it into a softmax, so we, we want to have the, the log likelihoods. Um, and it'll probably be an approximation because uh, it has to be, be low rank, probably the, the, the embeddings that we're using are much smaller than our vocabulary size, so it's, it's an approximation of that. But, uh, when we see that product, that, that's what it means. And that actually right there is everything useful I have to say on zero-layer transformers. Um, but it is, I think, a genuinely useful statement because um, when we study larger transformers all the way up to very large transformers, every equation we see, uh, or at least the overall equation for the transformer, will always have a term that looks exactly like that, W-U-W-E. And so when we see it, we should immediately suspect that it's going to be doing some kind of bigram statistic-ish like thing, and we should think back to the humble zero-layer transformer um, and remember that. So, okay, that's what we have to say on zero-layer zero -layer transformers, um, and uh, in our next video we'll dive into one-layer attentional mid transformers. All right, stating the obvious for people who haven't done the math and linear algebra in a little while, so Normally, we think of vectors as column vectors. So when you multiply them by the matrix, you multiply the matrix on the left and the vector on the right. So if I multiply a vector by a matrix and I get a new vector, and then I multiply that by a matrix, and I multiply that by a third matrix, okay, I still have a vector at the end. But just to be clear, 
I'm always left multiplying uh, by the matrix. So when you see this expression, W, U, W, E, it, you know, if your vector X is on the right, it means first you're going to multiply by the E weights, the embedding weights, then you're going to multiply by the U weights. So you're always, re I, I find it a little bit annoying, but you're always reading these from right to left. So in English, we read from left to right, but in terms of what happens, it's always from right to left. So if you see three, four of these, just know you're really reading in terms of like which happens first, always from right to left. Neurologists are stunned. They've confirmed that ear ringing is shrinking your brain cells. In our previous video, we talked about what's basically the simplest model bearing any resemblance to a transformer you could imagine, the zero layer transformer. But now we're ready to go and graduate to a more complex model, the one layer attention only transformer. Now, it's only a little bit more complex, um, but it will be able to go and give us uh, some, some really interesting properties to study. Um, and I think will we'll help us understand uh, larger transformers in the future. Now, we're gonna have to work through a non-trivial amount of theory. So it's worth maybe just briefly talking about why this is worth investing in. Um, or why I think why I think this will pay off to working through this theory. And the biggest reason is that we're going to be able to, in principle, fully understand a toy model. And well, I, I, I guess we 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 often I feel like we give up on fully understanding neural networks. And here uh, we're going to be able to go and and take you know something that's that's sort of a small transformer, um, and we're going to be able to, to get, get to a point where we will just be able to completely understand this model. Now we'll have to look at some large matrices and you know it, we won't be able to keep it all in our head, but we'll we'll be able to sort of explain um, all the behavior of this model by consulting some large matrices and in principle fully understand it. We're also going to develop some conceptual tools that I think are really useful um, for reasoning about larger models and will we'll continue to help us as we as we go forward to, to larger models. And then finally, um, actually, it turns out that even though larger models and sort of genuine transformers are going to have uh, more complex circuits um, and uh, and more complex behavior, some of the things that we observe in these models, um, these this toy model is gonna are gonna reoccur and sort of have some echoes, and so we'll see them again, and that'll it'll, we'll sort of get some useful intuition from studying this model. I think. Okay, so. Uh, we're studying a simplified model, and as the name suggests, the zero layer attention only transformer is, uh, or sorry, the one layer attention only transformer is a one layer model, and it's attention only, which means that it has no MLPs. Um, but there's two other smaller, those are, the, those are the big simplifications we've made, but there's two other smaller simplifications. Um, we're gonna get rid of layer normalization. Uh, and, that's just because layer normalization, um, we think probably isn't a, a critical part of the story, um, but it is, would add a lot of bookkeeping and a lot of additional work to think through in our theory. Um, and similarly, we're gonna ignore the biases or get rid of the biases, um, because again, those would add a lot of complexity. Now, the, the model that I'm actually looking at when I, or will be looking at when I give you empirical results uh, later on, and um, that'll be in another, in, a, in the follow-up video to this one, uh, will have, does actually have uh, layer norms and biases, um, but uh, I'm gonna align them to keep things simple. Okay, so uh, really, if we wanna talk about an attention-only transformer, there's three steps, um, or at a very high level at least, you can summarize it in three steps, which are, we're gonna go and uh, embed our tokens, so we'll we'll represent our tokens as one hot vectors, and we'll multiply them by the embedding matrix. Then, um, for each attention head, we run the attention head and add it into the residual stream. So that corresponds to um, we have all these attention heads over here. And we're going to add them in to the residual stream, this line down the middle. And then finally. We're going to go and uh, multiply by the unembedding matrix to get the logits. So that's how we'll get the logits, and that's, that's the output of our model. Okay, so I'll 
the, of course, we need to, you know, in order to actually understand this, we're going to need to dive into the attention heads in a lot more detail. And a relatively standard way to describe the attention heads um, might be something like this equation that we have at the top. Uh, so what is it saying? Well, it's saying something like, um, first, we produce the value vectors by multiplying the residual stream by WV. Then um, we go and we multiply and we go and weight all those value vectors by our attention matrix. Um, so that moves, uh, yeah, goes and combines the, the value vectors for different tokens. Um, and that weighted combination uh, gets multiplied by WO so we can add it into the residual stream. Okay. So just a quick comment here. So when they when they talk about this attention uh, matrix A, this is not the raw weights, but this is after you do your query key business, um, you're going to have a relative set of weights. So the weight between, you know, if you're if you're on um, the fifth token, then you know you're going to have the 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 amount it's attending to itself, which is you know five five. And the amount it's attending to the one to its left, five four, and then the one to the left of that, five three, five two, and then the first token, five one. And so those will add up to one because we use the soft max, so they're all like probabilities add up to one. Uh, but basically, that's what they're talking about. It, this A matrix being is just sort of your list of attention weights after you've done the attention business. And they will talk more about it, but but this is. Um, um, this is where this A comes from. Everywhere else where you see a W, it's literally the weights that are in the model. So the W uh, E is the weights that are in this box right here. And W V is inside the transformer. You know, there's Q, K, and v, v. These are literally the V weights that can multiplied by whatever value here. We're calling it X, but whatever values on the, the uh, residual stream at this point. Yeah, and sorry, what's the WO again? WO is output. So that corresponds to this output unembedding box. Okay. So after you've done all your attention layers, there is one more just regular neural network that converts um, the residual, you know, stream, the, the, the vector uh, uh, yeah. into uh, um, uh a set of weights that are then normalized with the soft max, but essentially, you know, so if you have a really big value in position three, then that means that you're going to have a high probability associated with the third word in your vocabulary. And if you have a really tiny value in position six, that means that you're going to have a very low probability associated with uh, whatever word is the sixth word in your dictionary. Hey, Ted, can I just cross check that? There, there is a an embedding weight and an unembed weight, but within within the attention, um, the WV is the part that converts the X into the value. I thought the WO was um, kind of the slice of the projection matrix in the attention block. Oh, 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 no! you know what? I'm so sorry. Yes, yes, sorry. They're calling this one WU. So, so thank you for catching that, Roger. Um, Yes, so inside just the attention mechanism, not the feed forward part, after you combine all of your uh, uh, values together, your weighted average of all the values, uh, there is a output projection matrix. So um, this allows you basically, if you, if WO were simply limited to permutation matrices, this would allow you to basically pick and choose what, uh, you know, what position in the in the um, residual stream you wanted. So if you had one, two, three, four, five as as values here, but your internal dimension of your model is five hundred and twelve, you could put that one in any one of the five hundred and twelve spots, and you could add the two to whatever spot that you wanted. Um, so now these don't have to all be ones. It doesn't have to be permutation matrix. Um, it can do other things like 
like scale or shrink, but uh, primarily we think of this as this allows you to sort of project what subset of the residual stream you want this sum of values to get added into. Thanks, and this, Roger. And this one, T is the number of attention heads, I guess they changed the, the T would line. appear to be the number of attention heads, yes. I don't think they've explained that. So, so we have jumped in really quickly. So again, if, you, <laughs> um, if you're not familiar with attention, this is, you know, um, the QKV and the projection and all that, um, we're going pretty fast here. Anything else? All right, so I'm gonna hit play and then this, this, uh, this equation at the bottom of the slide, they are gonna go and explain it. So, so don't worry, they're, they're not just assuming you immediately know how to get to that equation. Ken, just a, well, uh, yes. just, thinking, just a, thinking a quick thought, depending on whether people are following or not, maybe we can just ask the question, if you wanted to find you know, show on your early, oh, it was on a different screen, wasn't it? The um, the picture of the transformer where those weights came from? I can show that, but you know, my transformer, it doesn't even zoom into the QKV output level. Okay. It's just showing it as a circle or whatever okay. box. So, okay. yeah. Mind, then. Yeah, that's, a, that's another layer of depth. All right, here we go. Hi. Uh, that's that 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 is a, a formal you know a definition of a of a of an attention head, but it's actually a kind of tricky definition to think about, and I think it obscures um, a lot of important facts about attention heads. Uh, and that's just kind of tricky because you know we on the one hand we have like matrix matrix multiplies that we have to think about. On the other hand, we have you know this weighted combination that's kind of orthogonal to them, and it's it's kind of complex. And there's another way we could describe it, uh, which is using tensor products. So you might not be very familiar with tensor products, um, but uh, they're actually, they're, they're very convenient. And one way to think about them is that they allow us to accomplish the thing that uh, we, we often accomplish by broadcasting or thinking about, um, uh, you know, multiplying certain dimensions when we, when we program in TensorFlow or NumPy or PyTorch. Um, so yeah, it would, be, it would be very common for us to say, okay, well, you know, First, we're going to go and multiply the vector uh, at each position for each token by WV. Okay, well, uh, the way we'll write that is we'll go and we'll put, say that WV is on the right-hand side of the tensor product um, and its identity on the left-hand side. And that just means we're going to multiply every, when we, when we just have a matrix on the right-hand side, it just means we, uh, we multiply the vector for every token by that matrix. Okay, well, the next thing we need to do is go and weight things by the attention pattern. Um, okay, well, that's that's instead of going and multiplying um, every the vector for every for every token um, independently. Now we're going to go and independently mix the, every every component um, across tokens. So we're multiplying across the token dimension instead of multiplying across the um, the the I don't know the the vector dimension or the model dimension or something like that. So um, that we're going to represent that by multiplying on the left hand side. Why settle for low yields when you can earn 9% annually divided into convenient monthly payment? Okay, well then we need to go and multiply by WO and multiply, we're going to multiply every vector, um, the vector for every token by WO. So that's, that's like the thing that we did on, at the beginning earlier when we multiplied on the right hand side. We're going to multiply on the, have WO on the right hand side and that just means we multiply the vector, um, every token's vector by, by WO. Um, and one thing that's nice about tensor products is they have this identity that uh, all the things on the same side, you just multiply them together, all the things on the same side combine, and, and uh, all the things on the other side also combine, and they're just completely independent. So um, if we want to understand what the, if we want to multiply these together and combine them, we look at, for the right-hand side, we'll go and we'll multiply w, by WO, and then ID and WV, and ID collapses, so we just get WO, WV. And on the left-hand side, we have an ID and then an A and an ID. So we just get an, an A. 
Um, we just have the attention pattern. So what that's really saying is that this the, the attention patterns action is sort of independent of the WOWV action. Um, and they're they're sort of separate things. So that, that's one that's one way we, you could think about it. Um, another way to think about this is you know, what is an attention head fundamentally doing? An attention head moves information from the residual stream of one token to the residual stream of another token. And when it does that, it has to pick some subspace of the, the, the attention head that it's moving information from. It has to read some subspace, and it has to write that to um, that sub, the information that it read, the vector that it read, to this, a different subspace in the residual stream of the, of the, the second token. Well, WOWV describes which attention head, or sorry, which, which subspace we read from and write to. And A describes which token um, information moves from and to. So A moves, describes what the, the token that gets read from and, and written to, and WOWV describes the, the subspace of the token that we're reading from that we, we read from and, and where it gets written. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty cool way to think about attentions. So Ted, I don't know if you were going to talk about that section there. I I yeah. I personally kind of understood the second equation um, and the implication of that. Um, I didn't really get the notation on the the first line. So is that important to understand the notion? When you say first line, you mean this line? <laughs> no, the next one down. Yeah, this guy. Yeah. 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 So right. So I wanted to share with you guys that. Um, I think this is sort of like the uh, appendix or whatever to the the, the paper. So I'm going to put this in the chat. Okay, um, and this will jump down immediately to this this particular um, part of the the web page. Uh, come on. Um, but so. When we think of an input, um, we, we say, okay, here's an X and, 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 and the, this token has, has X sub five. But if you think about the collection of Xs, okay, X1 through X5, how you can think of that is basically as adding another dimension to it. So if you say that X is a vector of 512 floating point numbers, then your entire input across all token positions is now a two-dimensional thing, which is token length by 512 in size, all right? If you now think of it as a two-dimensional thing, then when you see something that says um, uh, ID, you know, cross um, some, matrix W, then what that's doing is it's saying multiply every single one of the uh, um, the X's by W. So do the same thing at every position. When you see something where ID is on the right and it says multiply by A, then that means that you're actually going to use the other dimension to multiply. You're actually going to multiply and you're going to you're going to treat you're you're gonna treat the the different token positions as basically like you know the row of the the, the matrix that you're multiplying, and then this one of the cool properties that falls out from this is that if you multiply things that have crosses with each other, so if you have a cross b and you multiply it by c cross d that is always guaranteed to be the same result as if you multiply the A matrix by the C matrix, and then you cross that with the product of the B matrix and the D matrix. So this A cross B multiplied by C cross D is equivalent to AC cross BD. So this property on this fourth bullet is what they took advantage of to convert from the first equation to the second equation. They just said, what are all the things on the left? 
identity matrix A identity. So identity times A times identity is A. And WO times identity times WV um, is going to be WO, WV. So that's how you get from the second, first one. So to get to this first one, what you have to know is what exactly does this mean? It means that you're going to multiply the exact same WV weight matrix positionally times every single uh, token, right? Because the, the, the weights for an attention layer are shared. And so whether you're in token position one or token position 1000, you have the exact same WV. So that's why you see this, note, this cross notation with WV on the right, okay? And at the end, when you're converting it to an output, you're doing the same thing. At each token position, you're multiplying what you have, your weighted values, by WO. The attention mechanism, however, is not doing that. It is not saying for each token position, multiply by something. No, it's actually working across the token positions. So basically, it's sort of like everything on the right, you can think of as like whatever, like working on columns, and everything on the left, you can think of as working on rows. So do you multiply the columns by an array, or do you multiply the rows by an array? And it has this nice property, as we said, that uh, then when you have multiple of these, you can just simply combine all the row things and all the column things separately and get a much more condensed notation. So Roger, did that answer your question as to how like this sucker became this notation? Yeah, I think so. I think I need to dive through that link you provided a little bit more, but I, I get the gist of it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so, so right, so you may be taking a little bit on faith, but the important thing is that WO and WV are multiplied at each token position. And so you're gonna see them in the same place, in this case, on the right-hand side. Attention happens across tokens. So you're gonna see it in the opposite place. You're gonna see it in this case on the left-hand side. So even if you don't fully know the notation, it should hopefully make sense that things that operate repeatedly on every token, you'll constantly see them on the right side of the cross and things that happen across tokens, which attention is the only thing that happens across tokens, you'll only see it on the other, the left side of the cross. All right, any other questions? All right, I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so now we can um, go and plug that into the previous definition we had of an attention layer, where we were going and adding all the, the different uh, attention heads and um, then going and adding them to the residual stream. And, you know, there's another way we could write that, which is, uh, you know, if we fix, if we fix the attention pattern, now that's, that's the attention pattern is computed in a very nonlinear way, but if we pretend that it's a constant or that it's fixed, um, well, then all of this is linear. And so we could go and write it as uh, a, a linear transformation that acts on x0, where we have an identity plus um, all of these, um, well, they're, 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 they're tensors in the mathematical sense. Back when I first became owner of Mint Mobile, I promised one of our first and longest running customers was C and we can even plug that into our, you know, plug all of our equations together. And we get this, this final uh, final end-to-end -end description of a transformer in some sense. So um, the identity term becomes W-U-W-E. That's, you know, you can think of that as, um, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up being kind of like bigram statistics. And uh, for every attention head, we have this term here. And we'll, we'll return to this um, this product on the right hand side. It's it's really interesting, um, and in, in some ways is, is yeah one of the most most informative things we can use to think about in this model. Okay, so um, that first term uh, is going to it's it corresponds to this direct path down here, this one here, and it's going to tend to represent bigram like statistics. Remember, in our previous video, we saw an identical term 
uh, in our zero layer transformer, and it was exactly the bigram, well, an approximation of the, the bigram log likelihood. That was, a, that was exactly what it was trying to do. And here, we're going to see that it's it's going to do something a bit similar. Some of the bigram information will move into the attention heads, but um, the remainder will, will continue to be on that direct path. But we also have terms corresponding to all of these other paths, right? So that's, those are all going to be in that sum on the right-hand side. And the sum has, each one of these parts of the sum is a, is a tensor product. And yeah, the this describes where the attention heads attend. Um, and this describes if the attention head attends to a given token, how does that affect the law jumps? So if we attend to a given token, how do we affect the law jumps? So that, that, that's very interesting. That, um, that sort of tells us a very large story, large portion of the story of, of what, this, what this model's behavior is gonna be. Now, the thing that we're missing is we still need to understand how the attention patterns get created. And then we'll, then we'll basically have a complete story. Um, yeah, now, I, I mentioned this earlier, but it's, uh, it's worth noting that this, this is, um, if you fix the attention pattern, it's linear. And that, that's something that we'll be able to get a lot of leverage out of. And in general, I think anytime you can go and split a function, you have a very complex function, but then you can split it into two things where if you hold one thing constant, it's a very simple function. If you hold the other thing constant, it's a very simple function. That's a, that's a nice point of leverage. And um, here's an example, where, a case where we have, have that kind of leverage. So that's, that's very nice. Okay, so how is the attention pattern computed? Well, the attention pattern computed is computed. Sorry, I'm a little slow here. Um, so I just wanted to um, reiterate. So we haven't talked yet about how the attention weights get calculated, but let's just say that you did have a uh, really high tension weight for all intents and purposes it's one it's putting all of its attention okay and so the fifth tension the fifth token is putting all of its attention on token two then basically what we're saying is you can use this uh weight matrix product w w o uh, w v w e times the second token and that is what is going to get added to the fifth token's residual stream Okay, so that's what they're what 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 they're sort of saying that like, if you imagine you just knew what the attention was, uh, what gets added is linear, based on this matrix product, and remember these weights are all once you've trained it these weights are all frozen. So uh, even though this is a long expression, if you you could pre-compute and you could just multiply all four of these matrices together and it, it would just give you a single matrix and it would just be a single linear combination of what started in the second token gets added to the fifth token. Did, when they say uh, the term fix the attention pattern, does that mean like for a given sequence, token sequence, just assume an, a, a specific attention pattern? Yeah, exactly. So they're just saying like for a given set of words, if you knew that the attention I was saying for, for word five is virtually 100% on, on, on word two. Gotcha then basically you can assume zero contribution from the first, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and then it's gonna be virtually 100%. So one times this. And if it's one times that, then you don't even really need a cross, okay? It's just, it's just WWWW, yep. that's it. Gotcha, thanks. And um, here's an example, where, a case where we have half that kind of leverage. So that's, that's very nice. Okay, so how is the attention pattern computed? Well, the attention pattern computed is computed by going and dot producting keys and queries. So we dot product the keys and the queries. But okay, how are those computed? Well, the queries and the keys are gonna be computed by taking the residual stream and multiplying by WQ or WK. And the residual stream is just the token times the embedding matrix. One hot the tokens represented as a one hot vector. So, um, so if we if we combine this together, we get WKWE and WQWE. And if we combine all of that together, 
uh, we'll find that the attention pattern um, is of the form of a softmax of um, the tokens on both sides and then this matrix in the middle. And that looks very similar to that uh, matrix that we saw earlier. And we'll see that it's, it's really telling us which tokens want to attend to which other tokens. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we have these two really interesting uh, matrices, uh, and they're both vocabulary by vocabulary size matrices. Stop using a VSL funnel and instead use a simple automated webinar without a pitch and without. And they seem to really be at the heart of this model's behavior. Okay, so why why do we have those matrices? Now, I can see a little bit mysterious, like they're products of four different matrices together and um, you know, why, why those matrices and, and what exactly do they mean? Well, okay, let's start with the first one. We're going to call that um, the output value circuit or the output value matrix. Um, and that's its form. And what's going on here is if we say, okay, well, fundamentally what it means is it, it it's saying if you attend to a token, this is how the logits will be affected. And if you want to understand what that effect is, well, okay, we start at the token that we attend to, we'll call that the source token, and we go through uh, WE, so we embed the token, and then we have to convert it into a value vector. So we convert it into a vac value vector by multiplying by WV. So we've gone through WE, we've gone through WV, and then we have to go, we go and the information gets moved by the intention pattern and then it gets hit by WO. Okay, so um, we have to go, because we are gonna go and add it back into the residual stream, so we need to multiply by WO and get hit by the unembedding and that causes a change to the output. And uh, in the simplified model, that's, that's exactly linear. So this matrix here tells us how, uh, what effect every token will have if we, if we attend to it on the outputs. So if you pre-computed this multiplication of these four uh, matrices, and ultimately you found that um, in vocabulary position three, you got a 0.2, then that means that you're going to increase the probability um, for vocabulary word two, you're gonna increase its logit by 0.2, okay? So uh, since I think it's E to the whatever or whatever, so like, you know, if you if you increased it by a full one, that would mean that its probability increased like 2.7 times. It's 2.7 times more likely uh, to be the word chosen if you add one to the probability of that particular vocabulary word. And if you subtracted one from a different vocabulary word, then that word is now 2.7 times less likely to be the the next word. So does that make sense in terms of like, this is a giant, you know, multiplication, but if you did it, basically it's a square matrix um, and the, the size of it is based on the number of vocabulary words you have. So if your vocabulary is 30,000, this is a 30,000 by 30,000 matrix by the time you multiply all four of them together. And it basically, you can read a row in a column and you can just say like, yeah, if, word 17 attended to word 10, then it would bump the probabilities this particular way. Where like, again, a one means 2.7 times more likely. So it has a very mechanical interpretation. And Ted, um, this model right now is um, ignoring position embedding, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And 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 you could think of the position embeddings, you know, as being part of the vocabulary word, but but the 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 same just generally applies, right. right? For a given input, whether it's positional or not, you can multiply it by this fixed. You know, once you've multiplied all four of them out, just it's just a single single square matrix, so you can multiply by that square matrix and you will get the impacts from any word to any other word. 
Gotcha. All right. So that's the whatever that color is, brownish uh, color. And now he's going to talk about the sort of purpley color um, other part of it. OK, but the second circuit, this query key circuit, it tells us which tokens want to attend to which other tokens. OK, so if you again, let's start with the, the token that's being attended to. And if we run it through the embedding matrix, and then multiply by WK, we get the key. And if on the other side, we're on the token that's going to do the attending, we go and multiply by WE, and then by WQ, we get the query. And so those two paths then meet in the middle. And we have to transpose this side because to go and make things work. Uh, and that gives us this matrix which tells us how much every token wants to attend to every other possible token. Now, this is ignoring um, the, the attention pattern also cares about uh, positional embeddings or um, some other, probably, you have to account for position in some way, and there's now a, a variety of mechanisms for, for doing that. Um, I'm going to elide that for now, and we'll see that there are a few attention heads that will care about position, and we'll, we'll need to go and just sort of uh, put that off to the side. Um, but you you could make this you'd, you'd add an if you were if you were just dealing with positional embeddings you'd add another term um, something that describes the uh, the which positions want to attend to which other positions and which positions potentially want to attend to other tokens that would probably be very small. Um, but uh, if we're just yeah if we ignore the positions that's that's exactly right. Okay. All right. So again, if you multiply this out, you're going to get I think I said vocabulary thirty thousand. A 30,000 by 30,000 square matrix. And again, this is, this is our very simple, it's only a one layer transformer. But this will tell you the, the pre softmax attention scores for every pair of words. So it'll, it'll say tokens. I, I'll, I'm going to keep saying words, but technically they're tokens, right? So it, it'll say that boy attending to whatever tree has a low score of 0.1. Uh, boy attending to shirt has a score of one, and boy attending to whatever, I don't know, ball has an attention score of three. And so if you just simply had a sentence that was, uh, I don't even remember what things I said, tree, shirt, ball, boy, um, you now know that the attention's gonna largely all be on ball because they had scores of, I think I said, 0 0.11 and 3. So you calculate the soft max and whatever the exact max wor math works out to, ball's going to get 90% of the attention. Does that make sense? So, so like this, so this square matrix, you can like just completely look up and just see like what is the relative affinity of every word to every other word. So this tells you the affinity levels. Now, of course, What's tricky is that when you have an actual sentence, then of course you have a combination of different words. And so I can't just automatically say that boy will always attend to ball really highly because maybe there's another word in the sentence that has an even higher score than three. And so if, if it has that, then it might you know have a score of 10. And so then it's not gonna be ball or whatever. And then of course, yes, when we get into a little more detail, we'll see sometimes there's positional attention as opposed to word to word attention okay but for now in our simpler world view of things we can just think of this as like this wonderful little lookup table that says how much does each word pay attention to each other word in our dictionary and then this top part uh says basically if we attend to it how much is it going to bump up or down the probabilities of each word in the output Um, Ted, I, shit, I think, uh, to, so I just wanted to kind of clarify on understanding of, of, the, of the kind of, um, the kind of, per, uh, the kind of, the, the, um, kind of the, the, the kind of, per, the, uh, the application, the purpose of this analysis. Um, my understanding from reading the link is that this is about trying to under, like, uh, trying to get a better understanding of how transformers work, I think. Um, 
um, on, on, on a really detailed level. Um, and is, 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 that, is that what this analysis is, um, is, is trying to ultimately explain? That, that's my understanding from reading this. Um, yes. This, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry if I didn't even, uh, I should have said that right at the beginning uh, in, in the introduction. This is about trying to lift up the hood and understand what is going on underneath the hood in a transformer, trying to understand how it works. Um, there's different reasons why someone might want that. If you're a researcher and you think you understand how it works, then you might also think about what sort of tweaks are likely to make it work better or make it work worse. And so you would want to design your models in a way that right, it works better. Um, there's other people who are looking for interpretability. Okay, so if my transformer model output blah blah, blah as its prediction, why did it do that and not something else? Uh, and so, you know, we know that in the simplest of models, like a logistic regression, linear regression, you have a very clear interpretation of every prediction it makes. Um, as you start to get more complex, grading boosting machine, not so easy to to come up with a explanation of why did it, let's say, uh, predict that Ted should not get a loan and Alan should get a loan. Ted's really risky and Alan's not risky. People want to know why it made those predictions, but it's hard. And right now with transformers, the empirical evidence says that they work really, really well, but people don't really know why. Yeah, I think I was going to say, I was just going to say something probably similar to some of the points that you touched on. I think one of the first points you touched on was I think if you can, if you can better understand how they work, we might come up with a kind of like a, like it might evolve in ways that kind of, um, the kind of simplify away the, the, the way, like the elements that don't contribute to how it works and kind of mm -hmm. Enhance the elements that that make it work better. I think, according to this analysis, yeah, yeah, and 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 right now there's enough research in ML that a lot of this has just been done empirically. But like looking at this model, if you were going to make an improvement on this, like one thing you could do is you could make the vectors that the words get embedded to into bigger. Instead of a five twelve float vector, maybe we make it a thousand twenty four. Right. Or we could do, you know, other different things. Right. And so if you have some of some understanding of this, then maybe that helps you mm -hmm. uh, have some intuition as to what you should try, because there are a lot of things you could try. And if you just blindly tried them all, it might take you a super long time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, because I think it did say preliminary step towards reverse engineering. Um, yeah. Implies, yeah. Yes. So they have made some simplification assumptions, but they have essentially fully reverse engineered a single layer transformer. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, what we know is that a single layer transformer can't actually do the things that GPT-3 can do. <laughs> so uh, our full understanding of the single layer transformer is not enough. We're going to have to keep going. And so that's the plan. And unfortunately, the work hasn't yet gotten to the point where they can say, I have this really rock solid, clear interpretation. Like I was saying to you that this, this, these four matrices, matrices, you can just, you know, pull the weights out, you can multiply them out. Now, again, a 30,000 by 30,000 matrix is kind of a big matrix. What is that? Uh, 900 million mm -hmm. entries in it. But it's very easy to read in terms of like, what's the affinity of the word boy with the word bat? What's the affinity of the word boy with the word girl? What's the affinity of the word boy with the word, you know, trip, whatever, right? So, so that is <clears throat> kind of cool that, that it has that very, uh, very simple uh, to explain, you know, interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that matrix also seems like it's likely to be very sparse. And... Mm. I'm it, guessing you can measure, you could probably detect and measure that. But. Uh, I don't think it's, 
sparse, Roger. Oh, really? You know okay. by the fact that it's made up of these multiplications that it actually is lower rank because you can decompose it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So if these are all like rank 512 matrices, then, then there's no way that that thing can be a rank 50,000 mm -hmm. uh, matrix. But matrix. in terms of sparse, like are there a bunch of zeros? Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's actually going to be a bunch of zeros in there. Mm -hmm. Roger, why would you think it would be sparse? Oh, um, just that a lot of times words aren't even used together. They're, they're unrelated. There's more words that are unrelated than there are words that are related, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, so, some I would think would be, um, you know, very common things like colors and, and size and stuff like that, that would, would uh, not be sparse. But, you know, the pizza and uh, um, a petunia don't often interact so i just would expect there to be more of those but just intuition should be uh, however however in this case uh roger uh we are looking at all bigrams let's say right for or, or in, if you remove the position aspects right we are looking at all bigrams and if you look at the combination of all bigrams now you're not looking at 50,000 you're looking at 50,000 by 50,000 mate uh set Right, fifty thousand by fifty thousand tokens. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah. how you project Q and K in that case may become more complex because then for each biogram you're trying to understand what is it that I should extract in this layer with query and key so that I get some valuable uh, information out of it. Yeah, I actually I think Rogers won me over a little bit. Um, now. Just to be clear, these are not bigrams in the sense that they have to be consecutive words. They just have to be words that appear together within the, the, the sequence length limit of this transformer, okay? So Petunia and Pizza will appear within range of each other every once in a blue moon, but I actually agree with you, Roger. I think even despite the fact that it appears once in a blue moon, it's probably gonna have uh, close to a zero um cer certain combinations like that if not exactly that are likely going to have uh, close to zero affinity mm -hmm. right now to be clear when we look later on you may see that there are words that have affinities for other reasons like nouns may have certain affinities with verbs oh, yeah. or you mentioned yeah. colors Adjectives may have certain affinity with any noun, it, you know, but not with verbs. But yet, right. at the same, to your point, I think, well, then, yeah, maybe it's possible that, like, colors will have very low affinity with all verbs. They'll be close to zero. Because I don't think the word walk cares much if the word red is in the sentence. Right. Right? The word walk cares about the nouns, but it probably doesn't care about the word red. So you kind of won me over, Roger. I don't know, like super sparse, but yeah, there's there's reasonably going to be zeros. I seem to recall some reference to the full list of, of bigrams. Um, so we might be able to actually, you know, evaluate that from the raw yep. data. Yeah, but again, this is not ninety million individually crafted uh, weights. It's right or 900 million, I was saying. It's 900 that are formed by multiplying these, these four matrices together that I'm gonna say are, are you know 512 on a side. So it's an approximation of what that 900 million weight matrix should be. Yeah. And it's gonna have a lot of whatever repeated numbers or zeros or whatever, because it's not, it's not fully uh, you know, individually filled out. Yep. All right. I think we're close to the end of the video um, and, and we can pause when we get to the end of this, but I, I just don't remember if he has one or two more closing remarks or if we're actually already at the end. Okay, so that is um, the theory of, uh, the theory that we're gonna need to understand one layer attention only transformers. And if you're interested, uh, the next video will actually leverage this then to go and understand uh, one layer, yeah, understand the behavior of a, of a one layer attention only transformer.
cool. So we're going to pause here uh, for today. Um, and in the next video, what they're going to do is they're going to show examples of some weights that they've seen, some patterns they've seen in actual one layer transformers that they train. Okay. So taking it out of just the theoretical and back into like, does this really happen? <laughs> does it really mean this? Um, so, so that'll be nice. And so next week, what we can do is we can start by looking at those examples. And then uh, when we get to two layer transformers, now you start getting more complex interactions and it'll take a little time to go through that. But then that's where we'll um, ultimately start to see things that are a little bit more complicated than just, hey, what's the affinity between these two words and a probability gets bumped up or down based on that. Awesome. Sounds good. I'm going to stop the video.